Welcome to Greater Mornings Oakland. I really want to introduce our speaker today. He is a co-chair and co-founder of Gooby Silverstein and Partners. He has been inducted into the Advertising Hall of Fame as well. This is the same guy that wrote Got Milk on a Napkin. He's well known for his quick wit, his humor, and his ability to harness restraint. And I couldn't have asked for a better person to talk about minimal. I want to welcome Jeff Goodby. Thank you. We're in a nice space. I love Pandora too, by the way. Big Pandora fan. I mean, th this shit's for free, you know? <laughs> there seems to be. I know there's something in there. Um, <laughs> I know there's a catch. So I, I used to be a newspaper reporter, and um, I remember the police telling me that there was this kiss theory that would keep it simple, stupid theory, and that's kind of minimalism in a police kind of uh, way. They also, uh, they, they also quoted a thing called the mushroom theory to me because I was a reporter. The mushroom theory was to keep them in the dark and feed them a lot of shit. <laughs> I was the mushroom. You know, I think minimalism is thought of as something where you take things away and make things mean more because you took stuff away. And, um, and I think that's true. But uh, the reductive part of it, I think, um, is maybe less important than the additive part, because eventually when you take enough stuff away, something suddenly is added by, by the absence of everything. And I think that's what's interesting about minimalism to me. This is probably thought of as the first minimalist painting. It's Kazimir Malevich's uh, Black Square. He did a whole bunch of these. This is probably the most or ornate of them all. Um, most of them were black, like, like you expect. Eve Klein patented this blue. Uh, actually did. He patented this with the French government. And then, of course, that became a, a famous kind of minimalist thing in itself. And if you used his color, you had to use his name. And there's this house that Philip Johnson did in Connecticut. I suspect this is the bathroom. I, you know, you've got a thing. I don't know. It must be in the middle of nowhere. I haven't been there. If you play the piano, you know this music. It's uh, Microcosmos by uh, Bella Bartok. Love this stuff. I mean, it's hardly there. It's like, it's like a kid playing, right? It's beautiful. Um, that's enough of that. <laughs> Ernest Hemingway wrote, maybe you guys have heard this, but he wrote what I think is the shortest short story in history. It's six words. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. It's pretty good for six words, right? It's not bad. And it makes you think. There's another one that, uh, that is attributed variously, so I'm not, I'm not going to guess who it is. She took a sip of coffee. I swallowed. That's kind of a nice short story. This is minimalism. I found a piece of minimalism on the ground, actually. One of those things that comes with your graduation tassel. Doesn't that sort of have a story when you look at it? There's kind of a story embedded just in that object somehow. I don't know why, but to find it on the ground, you know, tossed away or lost, maybe the person was sorry that they lost it. Maybe they wanted to lose it. You know how you feel when you graduate? It's like, fuck this. <laughs> and um, it might have been that. Charles Barsotti died yesterday, so I thought I'd honor him with one of his cartoons, New Yorker cartoons. This is a dog looking into an empty bowl, and it says faith at the top. It's a beautiful piece of minimalism. What happens, of course, is the guy shows a lot of other stuff, and then he shows his own work. That's what's going to happen now. <laughs> it's only 20 minutes. Come on. <laughs> So these are the logos that my company has used for years. We've been in business for 30 years in San Francisco. The first three I drew myself. They are the buildings that we were in. Then we tried this sort of weird Japanese looking trivity thing. It, 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 it kind of sucked. People didn't like it. So we had to move beyond that. The guy who does this stuff for me now has put together a system. He, God knows he started here with these dots that are kind of on concentric circles. And, and basically, this is a logo. It's a very minimal logo. But the thing that's interesting about it is you can customize it and use it any way you want. This is a poster. So what, what, what it is, it's got a G, an S, and a P in these uh, weird sort of colored disks. And you can use them in any order you want, as you'll see here. That, that would be the outside of the building with some weird growing 
stuff in the discs. Hopefully it keeps alive. If it, if it dies, it's not, that's going to be a bad scene. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a business card. So you can design your own business card and put the discs in any, any place you want. And you can make them big and small, too. So this is uh, something that one of our designers made. This is something you can use uh, in reverse. You can use it in odd kind of stripey ways. It stays nice and minimal and simple. You can print it on stuff and crumple it up and make arty pictures like that. Uh, you can put it on your hand. So, I mean, one of the things that's nice about this is it's very playful and useful, and it's so minimal that it works in almost all of these different contexts, which I, I think is really interesting. I wondered, I have a house up in St. Helena, and I, I did something to it that was kind of interesting. Um, one day I was on the airplane, and I thought, you know, I had to paint this house. And I thought, what if I put words on it? It would sort of turn the house, it would, it would take the house and make it into an object that you print on. So suddenly the meaning and, and uh, existence of the house had a different kind of presence. It became a, a carrier of information. And, and, then, and I tried to make it carry information about the inside of the house. So that's a little comp that I did on Photoshop. And my wife immediately said that I shouldn't do this. I went around to the neighbors and asked them if it would be okay, and they said, no. <laughs> but, but I did do it. That's the actual thing. <laughs> I promised them I'd take it down soon. And uh, so I, I did. I did actually put these words on the house, and they're words that kind of describe the life inside the house, like child and egg and together and listen and bumblebee and things, things that might have gone on around the uh, life inside the house in a kind of poetic way to make the house sort of transparent so you can see. And it, and it kind of overlapped interesting little details of the house like that. It had reflective words like silly on it. And you can see it wrapped around nicely around little objects like that. So, and you know, that, that I think is a, is a an interesting thing because it kind of reduced the house to one object. You know, a very complex machine, a house reduces it to being one thing that's kind of printed on and carrying information. This is tequila. It's a tequila bottle that I designed. And um, a, a bunch of friends of mine are importing. It's, um, it's expensive. So I'm not going to try to sell it to you. But if you see it, try it. It's pretty good. It's called Tears of Yorona. But the reason I put it up here is not to sell it, but to say we tested all kinds of real fancy bottles. Like we made things that look like perfume bottles, big teardrop shapes and so on. We tested all of those in, um, in focus groups. And it turned out that a really simple bottle like this with, with handwriting on it far, far outscored those other things. And I mean, I think it's a lesson in life. You know, simplicity that kind of allows the, the, the liquid inside to sort of be the important thing, I think is a, a very interesting kind of lesson in packaging. It's a lesson in all kinds of communications. I'm going to show you three things that have really short kind of advertising taglines. And we talked about Got Milk, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But this was a company that Mark Andreessen started. It was uh, the first of the cloud computing kind of companies. And it was full of engineers. So we thought, you know, let's, let's make this an engineering kind of tagline. So we used the tagline plus or minus zero. <laughs> which nobody understood. <laughs> they were like, the company's out of business now. Um, <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> this is another very simple tagline that we did uh, in the 90s and early 2000s for uh, HP. We took, I don't know if you guys are so young, you probably don't remember, but Hewlett Packard used to have a very complex logo that actually said Hewlett and Packard underneath that blue lozenge HP thing. And, uh, and they actually had added some kind of expanding possibilities words underneath all of that. It just looked terrible. So when, when we started working on it, we, we suggested that they do away with their, their names up and, up and, up and uh, top and bottom. And they do away with expanding possibilities, which means nothing, and put the word invent on there because it's an, it's an engineering company. It's a place of inventors. They have their own like little lab where you can go to at the end of the day and, and weld things and build stuff. Um, that doesn't even have anything to do with your life at the, at the company. So we basically took that invent thing and we put it together with other companies so that things like DreamWorks, they would work together with HP to do something big. So it was always like an additive kind of thing. We, we stripped it down to two companies working together and, and inventing something, something new. 
that's uh, sort of a, the first of the ads that we did. It, was, it says Rules of the Garage, and it actually is about the, uh, the garage that Hewlett and Packard started the company in, kind of going back to the heritage of inventing. And then we did things like this commercial, f which showed their partnership with Porsche in a very arty way. Je suis le vent. Je ne m'arrête pour personne. Je ne respecte personne. Seul, je vais sans but. Vers où? Vers quoi? Je suis le vent. Le vent. Le vent. Je suis le vent. Porsche uses HP high performance servers to design the world's most exciting cars, making the wind very happy. Tu es si belle. Excuse to shoot in Paris. Um, <laughs> I have a couple of gut milk things. The gut, you know, the, the, the gut milk thing wasn't ever really written on a napkin, although it's, it's a good story. It actually, actually came from a meeting where we were going to talk to the client about um, something that a person had said in the focus group, which was, you know, nobody cares about milk until they run out of it. It's the only time that it means anything. So we were going to introduce that idea to them. And there was a section of that meeting that um, one of the people in the meeting said, what do we call the section? And I said, I don't know, call it got milk with a question mark. And, and she said, why don't we call it got enough milk? And I said, no, it's kind of cooler not to have any other words, just got milk. So she put that on a, like a piece of uh, illustration board. And it was kind of hanging around in the meeting. And I was thinking, geez, do you think we could really use something as stupid and simple as that as the tagline? And, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I came up with some kind of a practice uh, idea for a commercial and gave it to the creative department. And of course, they did much more interesting things than I, I ever thought of. You know, they did a lot of I iconic stuff like this. That's really minimalist. You know, it's an, it's an image with two words. And then they, they made elaborate things like this. Stop. What? Stop. So, you know, a long run, but in the end, a minimalist ending is what kind of makes that work, is that there's virtually nothing at the end, and, uh, except that little boy. He's a, he's a lot. He's a spooky little dude. How did your neighbors react when you just went ahead and painted the house with the words after the fact? Well, I did ask them. I really did. I went around to the they ones no. immediately. A, a few did. <laughs> you know what? In the end... It's really funny because there's one 90-year-old guy that lives next door to me, and he was probably the grumpiest about the whole thing. Uh, his name is John Sales. And he, um, <laughs> in case you know him, that's my opinion of the guy. Um, he, uh, he was, what? No, not their director. Yeah, some other guy. And um, he, uh, he really didn't like the idea. He thought it was going to be stupid. And after I did it, he, he sort of grumpily was like, yeah, it looks pretty good. How long is it going to be up? And I said, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to leave it up like just for a few weeks. But people started asking that it stay up. And, and it, and it's, but it started to create some problems. with People would drive by to look at it. And that became a pain in the ass for the neighborhood. And so when that started happening, I decided to take it down. But it had a really nice sort of little Harry Potter kind of look to it 
in the evening and stuff. And um, when I took it down, John said, why'd you take it down? <laughs> it was so funny. He had done, done a total 180 on the thing. Font choice on the house, why? You know, I just thought it looked, I think it probably, um, it probably, it probably comes from the same uh, era as the house, when you think about it. I think it was designed around the turn of the century. And um, it just seemed to fit. It's very readable and sort of beautiful in different sizes. And you know, there were, some of the letters were like that high and some of them were only little like this. And you know, it was interesting to put them up. The guy, that, the sign painter that came and did it with me thought I was out of my mind. <laughs> but after he did it, he started going, we could do this at Christmas for people. Like, just put Christmas words up and then, you know, paint over it for them later. <laughs> I was like, he was going into business. <laughs> do you instruct in locally here and do you also and or mentor individuals if somebody were, say, to want to have you as a mentor? I mentor a lot. I mean, you know, I, I, I do lectures at schools and uh, colleges. And I was on the board of the Art Center in Pasadena for quite a while. But, um, and I taught down there when I did that a little bit. I don't, I don't do a, a formal course. I mean, I, it would be fun to do. I just haven't had time in my life. I, I'd, I'd like to. Um, I, I mean, I enjoy doing stuff like this. And, and, I, and I do enjoy you know, mentoring people that work with me. Everyone's younger than I am now, so that's what, how it works. I studied English at Harvard, and I, I never really studied this kind of thing. My parents were appalled. <laughs> I think one of the challenges of minimal is taking something like a large corporate organization like HP and boiling it down to one thing. So do you have any advice on how do you help to get brands and boil them down to that one truth that rings true? That's exactly, the word truth is what it's about, man. It's, um, it's about trying to find something that gets people's heads nodding and has them go like, yeah, actually, that's really what we do, and that's cool. You know, that's at the heart of it. And most of the time, they want to add things to that. You know, the, the way that corporations work, they're like, you know, well, we don't just invent. You know, we also enlarge. So let's, how, what if it was like invent and enlarge? You know, I mean, you know. <laughs> And then you just have to go shoot yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Finding the truth is the key to it. Like try, just keep reminding people that's not true. That enlarged thing is not inspirational and it's not true. What you do is you're, you invent things. When you make ads, video ads, uh, how do you work with production companies like in terms of the process? When you make the scripts and everything, and how do you work with directors and DPs and things like that? All sorts of ways. You know, it used to be that we would come up with something get a bunch of money, go bid it out with different production companies, and they would hire the DP and the crew and so on. But nowadays, you know, we hire a lot of people directly. We have people that work at my place that are good filmmakers. Um, we make a lot of things ourselves. You know, I have people that are really terrific. I mean, you know, do, doing the kind of things that you guys like to do, I expect, you, you, should, you should know about Photoshop. You know, you should know a little bit about Final Cut, you should know a little bit about how to shoot a film, you should know a little bit about how to use InDesign and so on. And Because those are the things that are the, you know, they're the, the, the sketch pads for today. You know, you send things across and go, what do you think of this? I mean, you got to be able to do that. I'm, I'm old and I can do that, so you guys can definitely do it. You got to know some of it. It's important. I, you know, and they're that's how people make stuff now. They they start from scratch and run out and shoot it and put it together. You know, you've probably all done it. Some of the funniest things in the world are very simple things that you make at home. When you hit a creative block, how do you personally deal with that and move forward? I think, you know, I, I go to a lot of movies and read a lot of books and things to try to keep my mind open. I also find that if you, like, change your routine it's very helpful, like just do something different. We all get up and do the same 10 things in the morning, you know, in exactly the same way, and the cat does the same thing, and the dog does the same thing, and they, they, make, you do, they make you do the same five things. You know, try to do something different, you know, ride your bike to work a different route. Um, I think all that kind of stuff seems frivolous, but it's actually important for keeping your head open. I know you're doing a lot of uh, pro bono work in Oakland, and uh, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that. I know you got a good one coming up. We started a project with the Bay Area Council and uh, Kaiser Permanente, who asked us to uh, 
to try to do something that popularized the fact that a lot of the uh, brain power, 80% of your brain actually is, uh, is, is mature and in place before you're three years old. And, um, and, th and that kids that get read to, sung to, and talked to before they're three actually have s s you know, monumentally bigger vocabularies. They have more financial success in life. They, you know, they make a lot more money over time. They g have a bigger chance of going to college. Um, all sorts of research about that. There was something in the New York Times about this just uh, a couple days ago. And, um, and so we, we tried to like, imagine a way to teach mothers, especially this is especially a problem with uh, lower income mothers that, and dads that don't um, necessarily you know, read these stories, don't necessarily have a lot of time in their lives for interacting with kids, or they think they don't. A lot of them think that there's no need to talk to a kid because she doesn't understand what you're saying, so why bother to talk to her? And, um, and so that was kind of what we were facing. And somebody at my place had this idea of what if, what if whenever a family left the maternity ward at one of the Kaiser hospitals, they got a little box. And in the box was like towels, blankets, one, onesies, like lots of, lots of uh, little useful things for an infant. But printed on them would be instructions for how to talk to your kid and how important it was to do so. So we designed these, um, these blankets these, uh, these um, onesies and so on, and we're lucky enough to have Angela at Oaklandish help us uh, realize this. So she's, she's printing a lot of these things for us now, and, um, and they're a reality. And one of the things that happened over the last few weeks is Hillary Clinton saw the wonderful work that she was doing, and she wants to pump a bunch of money into it um, from her foundation, which is called Too Small to Fail. So I think the thing will get a lot bigger than just being a, a Kaiser project eventually. That's our hope. And um, they're really beautiful items. I, I don't know if they're on your site yet, but um, th they will be. They, they're really, really a nice job. I mean, you know, and I thank Angela for that. This is really helpful. How hard is it to convince a client minimalism when they, the client insists on doing something like extremely complicated when you know in your heart that minimalism for this project or this campaign is the way to go? Um, it depends on who they are. You know, I, I use research for things like that a lot, frankly. Is, you know, because the clients always want to add things. They always want to change things a little bit. And sometimes, sometimes they're right, you know. Sometimes they're not right. And um, I think one of the ways to sort of keep ideas fresh is to put them into, um, put them into research, get some reactions from real people. Uh, so that they just don't have to take your word for it. It's kind of important that, that you try to remain fresh about your own ideas. I think a lot of times we, at least if in the commercial art business, we tend to like go, okay, I'll make that change for this guy. I'll make a change. I'll make that change to, okay, I'll make it green. All right, and suddenly the thing doesn't look anything like where you started. You lose your own perspective on it. And um, I really think a lot of times starting over fresh is really important to do just to go, Okay, forget it. You know, let's not do that to this poor little baby of mine. <laughs> um, let's start over with another baby. What do you do with a problematic client? <laughs> I'd like to know. <laughs> you know, um, this physical violence. Um, there. Uh, well, one one thing you do is you get to know them and find out why they why they think what they're thinking. You know, and um, and you know, put yourself on the other side of the table and put their head on and try to see what you're saying to them from the other side of the table. Because I think a lot of times we forget to do that, and um, and sometimes they have a point, sometimes they don't. If they don't have a point, then you can talk to them about why you don't think so a little bit more um, articulately. And also, I think that. Um, you know, over time, if that doesn't work, you have to have the courage of your convictions and not work with them. I mean, you know, it's your, in the end, it's your work. You know, nobody's going to remember the sort of so-so thing that made the client happy, and nobody remembers nice meetings, as one of my guys says. And, you know, I mean, they, they look at that stuff, and if it's not right, then you shouldn't be doing it. I wanted to follow up about research and hear from you what you think 
the role of account planning or consumer research is in terms of getting to the right minimalism for a project? I'm a real big fan of account planning in the sort of sense of talking to people directly. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that big a fan of using like um, quantitative research before we start working. I mean, I, I'm, I'm cool with people listening to pe other people talk about things and how they feel. I think that's very useful. But I, I don't like the idea of like looking, you know, looking at numbers and going, it tells us that the thing should be red, so you know, start with red. That's a given. I mean, I don't like that feeling. After we finish it, I, I'm not afraid of that. I'm not afraid of put, putting this stuff up to research later. I mean, one of the things that came out this week was that the Got Milk line was, uh, the University of Georgia said that it was in the top 10 most liked and also in the top 10 most remembered taglines, which was interesting because there weren't too many that were on both sides. And I thought, you know, that, that probably, that means that the ones that were liked sometimes weren't remembered and the ones that were remembered weren't liked, which is strange. But, uh, you know, I'm not afraid of research like that. It's helpful. You had mentioned you went to Harvard for your education as opposed to kind of an arts design background. And I've seen kind of being peripherally involved with with creative industries over the last 20, 25 years, that the people coming into the industry now are specialized, you know, in their education in the industry. And like all the people I've talked to that are kind of from where you are, like be they photo directors or everybody else, start in the film room and, and work their way up. But it doesn't seem that that way into various creative industries is available anymore, and I kind of wonder, does, how do you feel about that, and do, do you feel that there is perhaps a shortage of different views because we don't have people coming in from different places anymore? Well, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening. First of all, you know, the things that we do in the art world now are more complicated than they used to be. Digi you know, there's, there's a learning curve for digital things that takes, it takes longer, you know, in some ways to, to learn that stuff. Um, but I still really trust the idea of having like, you know, a general education and kind of knowing, actually having read a book or one or two and uh, knowing who Shakespeare is and stuff like that. I think that's, that's really good no matter what your field is. And, and I, I, I love people that, you know, get some kind of a, an undergraduate degree and then go to an art school for a year or two. I mean, I, I love that kind of education because they tend to really think better than people that just jump right from high school into art and, you know, and the only thing they know is sitting at an InDesign um, screen. So, uh, you know, I think, I think real world experience is what makes you sensitive in some ways to what people like and what people find funny. I don't, you know, I don't think there's any one way into these businesses anymore. Frankly, I mean, I have people that work for me that, you know, never went to college. I have people that work for me that have law degrees. You know, I think basically what you look for is people that understand humans, you know. About getting to minimal, do you have any touchstones or principles for how you get from the brainstorming mush and 100 taglines? Is it like a chipping away or like do you, do you have concepts or? Tools. Um, I show them to my kids. <laughs> Actually, I do do that, and the people that work for me hate it because I'm like, wait, wait, what are you saying? My son's not smart. <laughs> um, no, uh, uh, I think that is a way is to show your friends, frankly, you know, to cut things down because a lot of times you fall in love with something, and you know, I, I a lot of times because I like. Um, I like things that are a little bit le indirect, you know, especially humor-wise, and um, a little bit more subtle. And sometimes they're just too subtle, and nobody gets them. And that you have to try that on people, or else you never learn that. So, especially if you're that kind of person that tends to get a little twisty, it's best to try it on people and make sure they get it. I, I, you know, I'm a believer in showing people things. A, a lot of people aren't. A lot of people are like. I'm a genius. I don't need to show you guys anything. You know, I mean, Steve Jobs basically said that. He said, uh, you know, I don't like focus groups because I don't need anybody to tell me, like, what to do next. I'm going to tell them what's going to be next, you know. 
you know, if you're Steve Jobs, you can get away with that, I guess. <laughs> he didn't really, he, you know, that's a little bit of baloney. I knew the guy a little bit. It's, he listened to people. <laughs> you were mentioning that um, nowadays InDesign and Photoshop are kind of the basics or the new age sketchbooks. Right. At the same time, it seems like the new generations, the old school sketching that you used to do in design architecture in these schools um, is kind of, seems like disappearing, but yet there's a different process in drawing by hand versus computer. How do you feel about that juxtaposition and the importance uh, of both of them, actually? Yeah. Well, I'm a big fan of drawing by hand, you know, because I know that there are a lot of people that learn computer art without ever doing it. And, you know, one of the things that Art Center that I was always a big fan of was they, they make you draw. They make you make things with your hands as a sort of uh, first year thing. And, and my mom is an artist, so she taught me to draw at a very early age. And, um, and it was really helpful, you know, because it doesn't, you don't have to be great at it. It's, like, it's kind of like that sketch pad level of Photoshop that, you know, I can operate at. It allows you to show people things or to take somebody else's file and go, what if you made this smaller? or tried this and give it back to them. So, you know, I, I mean, having hand skills like that, and I don't think there's a big difference between drawing and, and you know, great Photoshop people. Um, but in, you know, drawing is the place that I think everything starts in many ways. And it's, it really is an important thing to, uh, to push yourself to learn to do and, and practice. I mean, it's easy to fall out of the practice of drawing now because, you know, you can you can just go search an image and throw it onto something and put some type on it and send it. And I I, I still really trust the idea of drawing. You know, try to do something that um, that that pushes you outside your comfort zone. You know, that's what I think is really really uh, that's what art is about in a way is to is if if you're really good at doing this thing and everybody's telling you that's really great, change it. Do something else or, or add to it, you know, twist it up a little bit and do something different with it. I think that's an important thing to, uh, to keep doing no matter, you know, what stage you are and no matter how much acclaim that you've gotten. If you look at people that are really good, they do that to themselves. They make themselves do something very different from what they've been doing. And sometimes that works, you know. Other times it's, you know, Bob Dylan and five really bad albums. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's... Um, it's a, it's a great thing to do, and I think it's important. Jeff Goodby, everyone.